Good evening, everyone. I'm Michelle Leifer. I'm the director of the USAN Institute for Animal Health Education at the Shoresman Animal Medical Center. On behalf of my colleague, Kimberly Young, I'd like to thank you all for joining us for tonight's event, First Aid, How to Prepare for the Unexpected with Dr. Anne-Marie Zolo, Senior Veterinarian and Specialist in Emergency and Critical Care at Schwarzman AMC. Um, I'd like to take just a moment to remind everyone that AMC's emergency room is open 24 seven throughout our building's renovation because where you go first for care matters. Um, and AMC's ER is the premier trauma center in New York City and our patients benefit from the collaborative care from AMC's 20 specialties and services all under one roof. And now it is my great pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Anne-Marie Zolo. Dr. Zolo earned her undergraduate degree from Williams College and her degree in veterinary medicine from Cornell. She then completed both a general internship and emergency and critical care residency at the Animal Medical Center. Dr. Zolo achieved board certification in emergency and critical care in 2017 and has remained at AMC as a senior veterinarian since completing her residency. AMC is very fortunate to have her on staff and we are so grateful to have her here tonight to lead our event. Please welcome Dr. Anne-Marie Zolo. Good evening, everyone. Like Michelle said, my name is Anne-Marie Zolo and I'm a senior veterinarian at the Schwartzman Animal Medical Center and I specialize in emergency and critical care. Um, first off, I would like to thank everyone for joining us tonight. It is so wonderful to have so many people here to learn about this important topic. Um, and tonight we're gonna be talking about first aid for pets, how to prepare for the unexpected. And like Michelle said, I'll be happy to take questions at the end. So just a quick outline for tonight, we're going to be talking about how to prepare a first aid kit for you to keep at home, how to assess your pet, first aid for specific conditions, when to bring your pet to the emergency room, preparing for your pet's ER visit, how to safely transport your pet to the emergency room, and then we'll just take a few moments to talk about disaster preparedness. So first we're gonna talk about preparing a first aid kit. Having a well-stocked first aid kit is especially important anytime a pet is far away from immediate veterinary help. So if you're going on vacation, you're going camping, you'll be away from veterinary care, having this first aid kit can be crucial in, in saving your pet's life. And it's also important to remember that first aid kits should be checked every few months to make sure that nothing in the kit has expired or needs to be replaced. So there's a lot of different things you should have in your first aid kit. You should have absorbent and non-absorbent gauze pads. You can see both of those in the picture. Adhesive tape, non-stick bandage material or a wrap like an ACE wrap that you can buy at the drugstore, blunt end scissors, disposable gloves, cotton balls or cotton swabs, some sort of over-the-counter antibiotic ointment, a nail clipper that's appropriate for the size of your pet, and small electric clippers are also a good idea if you have to shave your pet's fur. It's also good to have towels and a blanket handy, a small flashlight in case you need to see into any dark places, some alcohol wipes, styptic powder in case you, you know, cut a toenail and cause bleeding, a sterile saline solution, a digital thermometer that you can take either a temperature in the armpit or a rectal temperature, fresh 3% hydrogen peroxide, an instant cold pack. You also wanna have some sort of oral syringe or turkey baster, a liquid dishwashing detergent if you need to wash something toxic off of your pet, a pair of tweezers, uh, a muzzle that's the appropriate size and type for your pet, an Elizabethan or cone collar as we call them, extra leashes or a carrier on hand. And when we talk about the Elizabethan or cone collars, there are various types. And as you can see in the picture, the blue collapsible collar in the front is something that's really easy to keep in your first aid kit because it, it collapses down to a very small size and it's easy to store and very, very convenient when you need it. 
It's also important to have the phone number, clinic name, and address of your veterinarian. And then also it's important to be aware of where your local ER clinics are, especially if you're traveling and you're in an unfamiliar environment, because you wanna be able to access these places quickly if you're having an emergency. Now we're going to move on to assessing your pet. In order to effectively assess your pet, you must know what is normal for them. And the only way you're going to know what is normal for your particular pet is to perform regular physical assessments on them when your pet is normal and not having an emergency. And you should ease your pet into this. So, you know, get them used to you touching them, feeling for their heartbeat, feeling for their pulse, taking their temperature, things like that. So that if you have an emergency, this won't be new to them or to you. And you want to record normal values so you can reference them in an emergency. And this is an example of some sort of chart that you could make. So you know that for your pet, they have a normal weight of X pounds. This is what their normal heart rate is. This is what their normal resting respiratory rate is. This is their normal temperature. This is what their gums normally look like. So that if you have any question in an emergency when things get very chaotic, you can refer back to your chart of normal values for your particular pet. It's also great information for your veterinarian to have if you present to them in an emergency and they say, oh, well, you know, Fluffy's heart rate seems a little bit high today, but you could say, well, he runs a little bit high. And I know that because I check it on a regular basis, which is really valuable information to have. The next thing you want to do when you have your pet and they seem to be having some sort of emergency is start with a visual assessment. So stand back before you even do your hands-on assessment and observe your pet. See what their mentation is like. Are they interacting with you? Do they seem depressed? Do they not seem to know where they are? What's their awareness of their surroundings? What's their activity level? Are they bouncing around? Um, do they seem very weak? Do they seem you know, agitated? What is their breathing pattern? Are they breathing comfortably? Do they seem to have a, you know, an abdominal component to their breathing? What about their posture and their gait? Are they falling over? Is their head turned in a weird way? Are they limping at all? Can they not use one of their legs? And then, like I mentioned, agitation, any signs of discomfort, you know, are they vocalizing? Do they seem like they can't get comfortable? So here we have a video of a very normal dog. And if I was gonna see this patient in the ER, the first thing I would do is look at him and say, this dog is very aware of his surroundings. He's interested in what's going on. He's breathing very comfortably. He seems to be happy. So this is a normal dog. And this is important that you do these things on your pet so you know how they normally act. Okay, so next we're gonna talk about how to take vital signs on your pet. And the two main ways that you can get a heart rate on your pet are to feel for the heartbeat in the chest or to feel for the femoral pulse, which is the pulse that's in the groin. So if you wanna feel for the heartbeat, heartbeat in the chest, you can have your pet standing and you basically just wanna feel on the left side of their chest immediately behind the elbow. And that's where you can feel the heartbeat the best. And you can just feel it beating up against your hand inside the chest wall. The femoral pulse can take some practice to find, and that's why we recommend getting started on this now. This is a dog that's laying down, but if you have your pet standing, what we recommend is that you take your hand and you, you know, cup it around the front of the thigh and you move your hand back and forth up towards the, the, where the um, leg meets the abdomen and feel for the pulsating artery there. Once you either feel the heartbeat or feel the pulse, you're gonna count the number of beats or pulses that you get in 15 seconds and multiply that by four to obtain the heart rate in beats per minute. And it's important to remember that the normal heart rate can be variable. And then that's why I can't stress enough that it's important to know what's normal for your, for your pet. In dogs, a normal heart rate can vary from 50 to 160 beats per minute. It's somewhat size dependent. So a giant breed dog, um, we would expect them to have a lower heart rate versus a toy breed dog, we expect them to have a little bit of a higher heart rate normally. Cats can have a normal heart rate anywhere from about 140 to 190 beats per minute. Um, when they're home and resting, it's probably closer to the 150, 160 mark, although we all know that cats are a little bit less trusting than dogs. So if you start trying to feel for their pulse, it might go up a little bit. Next, we have respiratory rate. 
this is best assessed when a pet is sleeping. So if you take the respiratory rate when they're up and about, if it's a dog when they're panting, if it's a cat when they're purring, it's going to make their respiratory rate confusing. So you want to take it when your pet is sleeping. And the chest rising and falling equals one breath. And I tried to capture on a video. It's a little bit hard to see a normal pet breathing on a video, but we can try. So one, two, three four. So you guys get the picture. Rising and falling equals one breath. And just like with the, the heart rate, for the respiratory rate, you're going to count the number of breaths in 15 seconds and multiply that by four to obtain the respiratory rate in breaths per minute. And again, the normal respiratory rate can be variable, but in general, if a dog or cat is sleeping, their respiratory rate should be less than 36 breaths per minute. And again, it's very important to remember that things like purring in a cat or panting in a dog can make it a little bit harder to interpret. So really you wanna do it when they're sleeping. Temperature, it's important that you have a digital thermometer at home. Um, obtaining a rectal temperature is the most accurate type of temperature that we can take in dogs and cats. So you want to have your thermometer, you want to lubricate it with some petroleum jelly, and then you insert it into the rectum. It is never worth being bit by your pet or making them resent you from taking a temperature. So this should only be done if you have someone else to help you hold your pet. Um, and it can be done safely. If you feel like you can't accomplish this safely, it's also very acceptable to get an axillary temperature, meaning a temperature in the armpit. So you take the digital thermometer and, and shove it up in their armpit, and you can get a fairly accurate temperature that way as well. Normal temperature, again, should be taken at rest. You don't want to take your dog's temperature after you've been out running for four miles because it's going to be elevated. Um, and in dogs and cats, a normal temperature runs a little bit higher than humans, somewhere between 99.5 to 102.5 degrees Fahrenheit. Another thing that's important to be able to evaluate in your pet is gum color. So a normal gum color for a dog and a cat, which you can see in the top two pictures here, is a nice uniform pink color. If your pet has pigmented um, mucous membranes, it can be a little bit harder to see, but you can also look at their tongue. So the tongue and the gum should be a nice pink color. You can see in the bottom left picture, the gums are very pale or white, which can happen with anemia or shock. In the center picture, the gums are kind of a bluish purple. That can happen when you're not getting appropriate oxygen. And in the bottom picture on the right, uh, those gums look very yellow, which signifies uh, liver disease. Um, the next thing that you want to be able to assess in your pet is uh, the way that they're breathing. So you want to be able to tell, is there any unusual noise that they're making? Is there an abdominal component to their breathing, meaning that you see the abdomen rising and falling more than it normally does? Does it seem like it's taking a big effort for them to move the chest wall? Is their head and neck out, outstretched because they're trying to get more oxygen? All of those things are abnormal. And you can see in this picture here that this dog's head and neck are both outstretched because this dog is hungry for more oxygen and trying to get more oxygen. The next thing you want to look at is the abdomen. Um, you want to see what the abdominal tone is like, if there's any distension or signs of discomfort. So you can see in the pictures here that this dog has a very nice tucked abdomen. He doesn't look like he has, you know, a, a, a balloon in his abdomen that's all blown up. You want to feel along your pet's abdomen to make sure that they don't yelp out when you touch it or anything like that. Other things you can look for during your hands-on assessment, evaluating for wounds or bleeding. You wanna evaluate your pet's eyes. Do they have a normal position? Meaning do the pupils look like they're in the center of the eyes where they normally are? Are there any abnormal eye movements? Like are the eyes moving back and forth very fast? And are there any signs of trauma to the eyes? And then in terms of the extremities, is there a, an abnormal position? You know, did your d dog or cat just um, sustain some sort of trauma and their leg is dangling in an abnormal position? You know, that could indicate that they have something broken or any signs of discomfort when touched. So again, the bottom line is that you know your pet best. If you notice a subtle change, do not discount it. You know, bring, bring your concerns to your veterinarian because like I said, you know them best. And if you notice that something is going on, you should address it. 
All right, now we're going to talk about first aid for specific conditions. Okay. Something that's really important to be able to do when you're going to be looking at your pet is to restrain them appropriately. Um, so, you know, that increases the safety of what you're going to do. If you have a second person with you, they can act as a restrainer and then you could do your hands on assessment. So you, if, if you have a, a dog who's sitting or standing, you want to take one arm um, and kind of cup their neck to keep their control over their head. And then the other arm can go underneath their abdomen. If you have a pet who's lying down on their side, what you want to do is use one arm to kind of place it over their neck to keep control of their head and then hold the bottom legs. If you hold the bottom legs when your dog is on their side, that's how you're going to have control over them and they won't be able to pop up. Um, cats can be a little bit harder to restrain. Um, they tend to be a little bit squirmier, uh, you know, and they are a little bit more ninja-like than dogs. Um, a, a cat burrito using a towel is a very effective method, um, you know, to restrain a cat where you just wrap them in a towel. Alternatively, you know, you can either uh, use the scruff cats, that's how their mothers carry them around, they're very comfortable with it, um, or you can even just lay them on their side and use your hand to cup around their neck to keep them down. All right, so first we're going to talk about toxin exposure. As we all know, there are many, many potential toxins. And this list is a very short list of all the things that your pets could get into that could be dangerous. Um, they could get into foods like chocolate, grapes, uh, xylitol and sugar-free gum, cleaning products, over-the-counter and prescription medications, both human and veterinary, um, certain vitamins, rodenticides, plants, antifreeze, recreational drugs, essential oils, and many, many more. So uh, toxin exposure is one of the most common emergencies that we see. So, you know, fortunately, we have really, really good resources that pet owners can use um, to determine whether or not what their pet it was exposed to is an issue. So you can call the ASPCA Animal Poison Control or the Pet Poison Helpline. And both of these um, resources are available 24-7. Um, they give you a case number that the veterinarian can then um, you know, call. They also will tell you whether or not you actually have to go to the vet. You know, If it's something where you're not sure, you can call them and they can say, no, you're okay to stay home, or yes, you need to go to the vet. And if you need to go to the vet, then we have this information that that we can use to treat your pet more effectively. When you call them, it's very helpful if you have your pet's weight because they calculate a toxic dose for the size of your pet, the product package, or at least know what it is so you can look it up. That will allow them to know the ingredients, the amount or the weight of whatever it was that was ingested, approximate time since exposure, and any symptoms that your pet may be having. If the skin or eyes of your pet are exposed to a toxic product, it's very prudent to check the product label for instructions for human exposure, because you usually can assume that whatever they say for humans, you should also do for your pet. So if the label instructs you to wash your hands with soap and water, you want to wash your pet's skin with soap and water. Or if the label instructs you to flush uh, your skin or eyes with water or saline, you want to flush your pet's skin or eyes with water or saline. Induction of vomiting at home should only be done under the direction of a veterinarian. And the only time that poison control is going to tell you to induce vomiting at home is if your pet ingests something that is likely to either cause great harm or potentially even be fatal, and you're not close to a veterinary facility. And part of that is because, you know, while hydrogen peroxide does induce vomiting, it can cause a lot of irritation to the stomach. And we have, you know, many medications that we can give at the veterinarian's office that can induce vomiting in a way that, you know, won't cause that same sort of irritation. Additionally, it is unsafe in some situations. So again, only done under the direction of a veterinarian. Um, these can include if your pet is unconscious, if it has a depressed mentation, if it's having seizures, if it can't stand, if it's having difficulty breathing, and then specific toxins when they're ingested, we don't recommend throwing them back up, like things that are very acidic, cleaning products, alkalis, things that are petroleum-based, things like that. So again, don't do this on your own. Call a, uh, one of these hotlines, and they can direct you as to whether or not this is advised. All right, next we're going to move on to seizures. So obviously seizures are, you know, can be very dramatic, very traumatizing for owners. Um, there's not much you can do in the way of treatment at home, but there are certain things you can do to keep your pet safe until you can get them to the veterinarian. 
first and foremost, you wanna keep your pet away from objects or areas that may cause injury or additional harm. Keep them away from furniture. You don't want them falling down the stairs. Um, you know, we have rarely seen pets who are swimming and have a seizure. Can, they can drown or, you know, aspirate water. You want to remove other pets from the area if your pet is having an active seizure. And this is two, for two different reasons. When your pet it comes out of the seizure, you know, they can have an altered mentation and become aggressive. Alternatively, other pets can get very scared and be aggressive towards the pet that's having the seizure. So best to remove all of your other pets from the area. You definitely want to time the seizure so that your vet can have a seizure log. Um, if your pet is very small, like a toy breed dog, or has a known risk for low blood sugar, like they're a diabetic on insulin, you can rub a small amount of syrup or honey on the gums because there is a chance that a low blood sugar is causing the seizure. And once the seizure has stopped, you wanna transport your pet for veterinary evaluation. This is something that you definitely wanna get them to the vet for. If your pet is having a seizure, do not try to restrain them. Um, you're likely to get hurt and, and it may cause additional harm to your pet. Do not place your hands near your pet's mouth. Um, you know, there's these old myths that say you should pull a person or a pet's tongue out while they're having a seizure because they can swallow it and choke on it. That's not the case. And pulling your pet's tongue out while they're having a seizure is pretty much a guaranteed way to get bit, you know, inadvertently. And do not try to startle your pet out of a seizure. It, it doesn't work like that. And um, it just don't do that. All right, next we're gonna talk about traumatic injuries and fractures. Um, this is a situation where you wanna consider muzzling your pet. Even if you have the sweetest, most gentle pet, if they have a bad injury, they potentially could bite you. And it's not because they're a bad cat or dog, it's because they're really hurting and this is their only way to communicate. When you're thinking about muzzling, which you know I'll mention a few times throughout this lecture, um, things to think about would be if your pet is vomiting a lot, you don't want to put a muzzle on them because that can uh, cause them to aspirate their vomit. Um, and if they're having trouble breathing, you also probably don't want to put a muzzle on. You know, if you absolutely have to, if your pet is snap snapping at you, you can put the muzzle on briefly just while you pick up the pet, but then you should probably take it off if any of these things are going on. So if your pet has a major trauma, you wanna assess for external bleeding. Um, and a little bit later in this lecture, we're gonna talk about treating external bleeding. And you wanna to try to immobilize them as best you can. If you have a small dog or a cat, the easiest way to do that is in a carrier or even a cardboard box with a top. If you have a large dog, a stretcher is indicated. So you can use you know, um, a piece of plywood. You can use a blanket like in the bottom picture there. You want to try the, to pull the blanket as taut as possible to limit the, the movement of your pet. If you have a dog on a stretcher, it's best to try to secure them to the stretcher, whether it be with um, towels or a belt or something like that. If you are going to secure them to the stretcher, however, it's important to remember that you don't want to put that um, you know, belt or whatever over their chest because you want them to be able to expand their chest appropriately. Um, and if you suspect that your pet has a fractured leg, do not attempt to place a splint at home. A poorly placed or incorrectly placed splint can actually cause more damage and make it harder to correct the fracture down the line. All right, now we're gonna move on to external bleeding or wounds. Um, again, this is something where you wanna consider a muzzle. Uh, there are a few different ways that we recommend trying to control the bleeding. The best method far and away is direct pressure. There's nothing that's going to be better than direct pressure. And you want to accomplish it using um, thick gauze pads. You want to press it over the wound and keep pressure until the clot forms. You want to hold the pad on the wound for at least three minutes before checking for a clot. Because if you keep raising the pads up before the clot forms, you're going to keep pulling the, the weak clot off of that wound. Once the clot forms, do not disturb it. Leave your pads there. Um, you can put a wrap around it and just leave it be. If blood soaks through the first pads, add more. Do not remove the first pads because you will pull any weak clot off. So just add more to it. And like I said, you know, once you get control over the bleeding, you can um, use bandage material to bind that compress to the bleeding area for transport. If you have a wound on a limb um, that's bleeding quite a bit, you can elevate that, that wound above, um, above the heart level, which may slow down bleeding a little bit. And then a tourniquet is another option, but tourniquets um, 
have the potential to cause harm. So you have to remember that a tourniquet is a last resort um, and it can eventually, you know, lead to death of the limb below the tourniquet and need for amputation. So this is not something that we take lightly. But if your pet seems to have blood that just won't stop spurting out of a limb, you can place a tourniquet and you can use um, a strip of cloth, uh, some roll gauze, um, a belt, anything like that. Okay. All right, and then this is just a quick video of how to uh, put pressure on a wound appropriately. So you just wanna press down with a nice thick stack of gauze and just hold it there, like I said, for at least three minutes before evaluating for a clot. Don't try to keep lifting it up. Um, some other notes about bleeding wounds, if there's a foreign object that has created the wound, like if it's an impalement and it is still lodged in the wound, leave it there. Never, never, never try to remove um, any sort of foreign material from a wound. It can cause more damage and it can actually make the bleeding worse. You know, if that object is pressing against a vessel and holding it shut, the second you remove it, it can cause a lot of bleeding. So best to leave that to the veterinary professionals where we can control the bleeding if need be. If you have a pet whose wound is superficial and the bleeding is controlled within five minutes, you may not need to go to the emergency room. However, you should see your vet within 12 hours to have the wound evaluated. Um, obviously, we know that bleeding nails are also a very common problem that we see at home. I will say that they bleed a lot. Um, so step number one is to contain your pet so that they don't trail the blood all over your home. And then you can use things like styptic powder which you can purchase or cornstarch even uh, to put on the bleeding nail and that should control things. Um, next, we're gonna just talk briefly about bandaging. If there is a wound that you need to bandage, you should clean it with uh, sterile saline. Once it's clean, you should try to dry it as best as you can because you really don't wanna bandage a wet area. Uh, if there is a wound present, you want to place a non-absorbent gauze pad on the wound, and then you're going to apply several layers of an absorbent, like, for example, cotton material, and then an outer layer to secure. If all you have is an ACE bandage and a gauze, that's also fine. This is just to get you to the point of getting to your veterinarian. If you do put a bandage on, you might want to consider an Elizabethan collar to prevent your pet from chewing on the bandage. Because even if they're very well behaved, anytime you put a bandage on their, a pet, their first inclination is going to be to try to chew it off because it's foreign to them. And here we have a video of bandaging for everyone. Um, so uh, Dr. Matula has a non-absorbent gauze pad here. Um, it's called a Telfa pad if anyone you know, is interested in what to purchase. Um, so she's gonna place that on the wound like so. Then she's gonna take her cotton, um, her cotton layer and wrap it around the limb um, and encircling the gauze pad itself to hold it in place. Now she's gonna take her top layer. Um, this is called vet wrap. Um, and she's gonna wrap that around the cotton layer. But again, if you have an ACE bandage or something like that, that will definitely suffice as well. That's it. It's very important to remember that at-home bandages are temporary and your pet must be evaluated by a veterinarian anytime a bandage is placed at home. Um, bandages, if they aren't done correctly and they're left in place for too long, can cause a lot of morbidity, meaning other wounds, um, promote infection, you know, things like that. So really, really needs to be evaluated by your veterinarian. All right, next we're gonna talk about shock. Shock has many different causes. Um, it can include internal bleeding, major trauma, abnormal heart rate or arrhythmias, whether it's a heart rate that's too fast or too slow, severe respiratory disease, anemia or blood loss, major fluid loss, like severe vomiting and diarrhea, an anaphylactic reaction or a severe allergic reaction, temperature extremes or severe brain or spinal cord injury. Signs of shock can include a very slow or very fast heart rate, a high or low temperature, a change in your pet's respiratory pattern, a change in the gum color, weakness or collapse, and change in mental condition or activity level. 
there's really not much you can do to treat shock at home. So your main goal is gonna to be to keep your pet warm, reassure them and get to your veterinarian immediately. Um, ocular injuries are something else that we see pretty commonly. Signs of ocular injuries can include known trauma to the eye. You know, if you're out playing baseball and your dog runs as someone swinging a baseball bat and gets hit in the eye, you, you know, you're going to have a pretty good idea that they've uh, sustained an injury to the eye. Squinting or protecting the eye, abnormal appearance or position of the eyeball itself, excessive redness of the white part of the eye, which is called scleral hemorrhage. And that's what we have in the top picture here inability of the eyelid to cover the entire eyeball or a bulging eye. If the eyeball is bulging or the eyelid cannot close completely, it's best to try to keep the eyeball moist with a lubricating eye ointment, anything you can buy over the counter. You probably wanna put that cone collar on them um, because you know if there's any chance we can save the eye and save vision, we don't want them scratching at it and hurting themselves further. And then you wanna to get to the vet. Another common emergency is straining to urinate. And it's important to be able to differentiate straining to urinate from straining to defecate because difficult urination represents a true emergency that can be life-threatening, whereas constipation you know, potentially can wait uh, you know, 12 hours until your regular vet is open. Um, urethral obstruction uh, is more common in male cats. This is something that we see um, pretty regularly where male cats lose the ability to urinate. Um, it's very important that when you're transporting your pet, you don't put a lot of pressure on the abdomen because if the bladder is severely enlarged, if they can't urinate, you can potentially um, rupture the bladder. And you definitely want to seek veterinary care immediately because this can be a life-threatening emergency. Um, next, we have heat stress or heat stroke. You know, we're heading towards the summer. So this is something that's very important to be aware of. Early signs can include agitation, panting, restlessness, or noisy breathing. Um, later signs can include drooling, an unsteady gait or collapse, weakness, vomiting and diarrhea, decreased responsiveness or seizures. And this can happen pretty much in any dog who um, is out playing in the heat, running in the heat, tends to happen more in our brachycephalic breeds like bulldogs and Frenchies because they can't um, uh, get rid of their heat as effectively because um, they have those shorter noses. So the first thing you want to do is move your pet into a cool environment or out of direct sunlight. You can pour water or use a hose to wet down your pet's body because that will help cool them. You can also place cool wet towels in the armpit um, and groin regions. You do not want to use ice packs to cool your pet because the ice packs are very cold and they can cause constriction in the blood vessels of the skin. And that gets rid of um, a way that dogs normally dissipate heat. So normally if they're very hot, they dilate those blood vessels to let heat off. So you don't wanna cause constriction of them with ice packs. And this is an emergency that you definitely wanna seek veterinary care for immediately because things can get a lot worse before they get better. Um, we also have burns. Um, they can be caused by heat, flame, chemicals, electricity. Uh, if your pet has a thermal or electrical burn, you immediately want to apply a cool water compress with a clean cloth to the site of the burn, and you want to change it frequently to keep the site cool and wet. Um, if your pet has an electrical burn from like an electrocution, very important that you make sure the electrical source is turned off before you touch your pet so that you don't also get electrocuted. And then you want to seek veterinary care immediately because burns can get much, much worse after the initial insult. It can even take days for burns to truly declare themselves. So you definitely want to get to the vet for this. For chemical burns, you want to wash the contaminated area with large volumes of lukewarm flowing water for at least 15 minutes. If a dry chemical gets on your pet, you want to brush it away carefully, making sure not to get it in their eyes or their mucous membranes. Um, make sure you're in a very well ventilated area if you're going to do that so that you don't end up, you know, inhaling or being exposed to these, um, these particles. And again, you want to seek veterinary care immediately. Choking is obviously something that every pet owner worries about. Um, very, very scary if it happens. Signs can include difficulty breathing, excessive pawing at the mouth, choking sounds when breathing or coughing, blue tinged lips or tongue, and a loss of consciousness. And it's important to remember that a choking pet is more likely to bite in its panic state. So just be careful. If your pet is still conscious, 
keep them calm and transfer them to the vet immediately. At the vet, we can give them sedatives. We have instruments that we can try to remove whatever they're choking on. So if they're conscious, get them in the car and just get to us immediately. If your pet has lost consciousness, you, you know, can open up their mouth and perform a finger sweep um, where you start on one side of the mouth and move towards the back and the center um, to see if you feel any foreign material. If there's foreign material visible, you can try to grasp at it with tweezers or something like a plier, but you have to understand that there's many delicate structures in the oral cavity and the throat, so you don't want to cause more trauma. You can perform the Heimlich maneuver, which I'm going to show you shortly. And if your pet seems like they're not breathing anymore, you can start rescue breathing, which we're also going to go over. Um, so this is a video uh, showing everyone how to do the Heimlich maneuver in a standing dog. Um, so basically, obviously this is a healthy dog. So he's a little bit more mobile um, than your pet would be if they were choking. Um, but basically what you wanna do is you want to uh, lock your hands underneath your pet's abdomen up you know, immediately behind the ribs up towards the chest. And then you basically just want to lift up as forcefully as you can to try to generate enough pressure in the chest cavity that whatever they're choking on gets dislodged. So let's watch this. So lock your hands and pull up um, with as much force as you can to try to generate that pressure to dislodge that foreign material. I'll play that one more time for everyone. It's also very common if your pet is choking for them to end up collapsing if it's a true choking event. So you also can perform the Heimlich maneuver with the dog on their side. So when you're doing this, um, you wanna make sure that their head and neck are outstretched so that if you do successfully dislodge whatever is in there, it has a straight shot to get out. Um, and you basically want to take one hand to um, kind of support their back and your other hand you're going to place on their abdomen um, immediately behind their rib cage and push up towards the chest. And I'm gonna show you guys in a video here. And it's important to remember as well that the Heimlich is only going to work if there's a complete obstruction because it works by generating a lot of pressure in the chest cavity and you need the air pipe to be closed off for that to happen. So if you have a partial obstruction, um, it potentially isn't going to work. Okay, next we're gonna talk about trouble breathing and we'll get to rescue breathing as well. Signs of trouble breathing can include unusual noises, um, an abdominal component to breathing, a noticeable effort to move the chest wall, blue gums or tongue, agitation, inability to get comfortable, and breathing with the head and neck extended. And you can see in the top picture that 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 pet looks very distressed um, and the tongue is very blue. And in the bottom picture, that cat is open mouth breathing. And in cats, open mouth breathing is always abnormal. The one caveat to that is that some cats, for instance, who never travel in the car can pant a little bit when they're in the car. Uh, but if it's you know uh, persistent, if it's happening at home, it's not normal for a cat to breathe with its mouth open. Um, in terms of what you can do, it's important to try to keep your pet as calm as possible, make the environment around them cool, because um, the hotter they get, the more they're going to try to breathe hard and it's going to be a vicious cycle. Um, and then you can perform rescue breathing if your pet becomes unconscious or stops breathing. And again, you need to seek veterinary care immediately. So rescue breathing should only be attempted in truly unconscious animals. If you try to attempt rescue breathing in an animal that isn't unconscious, it's pretty much a guaranteed way to get yourself bit and your face at that. Um, so what you wanna do is you wanna hold your pet's mouth closed with your hand. You wanna cover your pet's nose with your mouth and breathe directly into the pet's nose until you see the chest expand. The chest will then fall on its own and you wanna give a breath about every four to five seconds. Um, CPR is also something that should only be performed in animals who are unconscious with a lack of heartbeat and uh, spontaneous breathing. Do not try to perform this in a conscious animal. There are some 
considerations when you think about undertaking CPR at home, first and foremost, you're not likely to be successful. Even in the veterinary hospital with all of our tools and our trained personnel and our drugs, um, our success rate for CPR is, is probably less than 10%. And part of that is because pets die um, from very for very different reasons than humans. Our pets aren't having uh, heart attacks like humans have sometimes. They're usually dying because they have very significant systemic disease. So the likelihood that you're going to be able to get your pet back with CPR at home is pretty low. So you just have to have appropriate expectations. It should not delay definitive um, veterinary care. So if, if you are the only person there and you're the only person to transport your pet, it's best to just transport them. There is a risk of being bit. And there are certain infectious diseases that can pass between pets um, and humans. So again, you wanna confirm that the pet is arrested and unconscious. You wanna extend the head and neck and pull the tongue forward. And in some cases, this can actually stimulate respiration. You wanna lay your pet on their side on a firm surface, and you wanna begin rescue breathing like we already discussed. Next, you wanna begin compressions. Um, in a small dog or cat, you can use one hand cupped around the sternum. In a medium or large dog, you wanna lock your hands and place them on the widest portion of the chest wall, so where the ribs spring up the most. You wanna compress at a rate of about 120 compressions per minute. Um, you can do your compressions to the beat of staying alive. And if you are alone, meaning you're the only person there, you wanna alternate 30 compressions with two rescue breaths. If there's more than one person, someone can be doing compressions while the other person delivers the rescue breath simultaneously. So this is a video of us performing CPR. And as you can see, um, Dr. Matula has her hands locked, uh, her um, elbows are locked, and she's compressing over the widest portion of the chest while I'm delivering rescue breaths about every four to five seconds. Um, if, if this goes on for a little while, the compressor will get tired eventually. So it's important for the compressor to be honest about when they get tired so that you guys can switch. Um, so that was how you do your compressions in a big dog. In a cat or a small dog, you, like I said, can use a one-handed technique. This is a one-handed technique um, where you use the heel of your hand to compress the chest. And then this is a one-handed technique that you can use in, in smaller pets where you cup your hand around the sternum and compress that way. Okay, some final reminders for first aid. Do not administer any over-the-counter medications to your pets unless directed to do so by a veterinarian. Many over-the-counter medications are toxic to pets, not safe, um, and can cause more harm. Additionally, anytime you administer first aid at home, it should always be followed by immediate evaluation by a veterinarian. Very important to remember. All right, now we're gonna briefly talk about when to bring your pet to the emergency room. As I mentioned before, any first aid administered to your pet should always be followed by immediate veterinary care. First aid care is not a substitute for veterinary care, but it can save your pet's life until they receive definitive veterinary treatment. If your pet is choking, having trouble breathing, nonstop coughing or gagging, can't catch their breath, their gums look blue, those are all indications to go to the vet. If there's severe bleeding or bleeding that does not stop within five minutes, it's time to head to your vet. Um, large or visibly infected wounds, bleeding from the nose, mouth, rectum, coughing up blood or blood in the urine, inability to urinate, obvious pain during urination, um, suspected or known toxin ingestion or exposure. If they have a mentation change, seizures, staggering or falling, uh, fractured bones, severe lameness, if they're not able to move their legs, if they are in obvious pain or they're very agitated or have a lot of anxiety, heat stress or heat stroke, severe vomiting or diarrhea, especially if it has blood in it, refusal to eat or drink for greater than 24 hours and ocular injuries are all reasons to bring your pet to the vet. And at the end of the day, when in doubt, it is always safest to have your pet evaluated by a veterinarian. Better to be safe than sorry. Okay, and just a note on preparing for your pet's ER visit. 
um, you want to know the location of the closest veterinary ER. If you're in your normal location, um, you can definitely ask your regular veterinarian, like, who do they partner with after hours? Like, who do they recommend that you go to if your pet's having an emergency? Um, and you want to know where they are. If you're going on a trip, also very important to know where the closest ER is so that if you have an emergency, you're not scrambling to try to figure that out. You want to have a copy of your pet's complete medical records. This is especially important after hours if your vet isn't open. Um, it's very, very helpful for the ER vet to be able to look at the records and understand your pet's history better. And you also want to have a list of current medications um, so that we can know exactly what your pet gets, how much they get, and when they last got it. You also want to bring activities, snacks, and a phone charger. Um, I'm sure everyone's aware that veterinarians have been very, very busy over the last few years, especially since COVID. Um, and, and, you know, the wait times can be a little bit higher, so important to prepare for those appropriately. In terms of transporting your pet to the ER, you definitely want to limit the handling of your pet as much as possible and handle them very gently when necessary. Again, there's no shame in using a muzzle. It does not mean you have a bad pet. It's a great way to keep everyone safe. So if it seems like they are in a lot of pain um, or they're trying to nip, a muzzle is a great idea. You want to transport in a way to limit movement of the pet and cat or for cats and small dogs. Again, the best way to do this is a carrier, medium to large dogs on a, a stretcher, especially if they're recumbent or unconscious. It's best to try to lie the pet on their side if it's comfortable them, for them. If you try to lie them on their side and they seem more distressed, you can allow them uh, to find the position that's comfortable for them and that causes them the least amount of stress and anxiety. A lot of times they feel things in their body that we don't know about, you know, and they are going to position themselves in a way that makes them most comfortable. If your pet is unconscious and you have them on a stretcher or in their carrier, you want to position their head in line with their body. If your pet has a depressed mentation or is unconscious and they're vomiting, you want to hang their head down to try to allow the vomitus to exit the mouth to decrease the chance that they're going to aspirate it into their lungs. And you can cover uh, your pet with a blanket if that's something that they like to kind of just calm them down. And then in some areas are professional transport services. Here in New York City, we have AmbuVet. Um, they're trained professionals. They have oxygen, things like that to bring your pet uh, from location to location safely. And then we're just going to take a few minutes to talk about disaster preparedness. Um, it's very important to know where you can go safely with your pet. Not every location that accepts people during an evacuation will accept pets. So important to know ahead of time where you can go with your pet. And you also want to make sure that your pet's identification is up to date, meaning that their microchip uh, is registered to you. They have a collar with the tags on it with all of your information. Um, you want to have food and water ready. You want to have a seven-day supply of food in an airtight container and a three-day supply of water. You should have bowls, a small uh, container of liquid dish soap, and a manual can opener if you feed your pet canned food. Um, it's a good idea to take a first aid kit with you um, if you have to evacuate. And you want to have at least a two-week supply of your pet's medications and with the dosage and administration instructions. And if you're going to have this supply ready, just like with the first aid kit, it's important to check it every few months to make sure it's not expired. And then you want to have documents. So you want to have the microchip and license information. You want to have a copy of your veterinary records with your vaccine history, your emergency contact list, including your veterinarian, and photos of your pet that you keep on you. And finally, you want to have travel supplies, carrier with contact information, extra collar and harness with ID tags and a leash, a portable litter box and litter for cats, and favorite toys and travel bed to make your pets more comfortable if you have to evacuate. And then we just have some additional resources here um, that I believe we'll also be sending out. So if anyone wants additional information about anything that we talked about, um, we have that here for you. And now I'll take any questions and I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Thank you so much, Dr. Zolo. This was fantastic. I know everyone, it, there's a lot of information. Um, as we mentioned, we'll be sending out the link tomorrow and a list of resources. Um, but Let's get to some questions. There are some good ones coming in. Um, we had a, a question about um, the chest compressions. Does it, should it be on the left or the right side? 
That doesn't matter as long as your pet is on the side. And again, you want to have them on a firm surface. Um, it doesn't matter which side. You, you don't want to do it on a soft surface because you're not going to be able to effectively make a compression, but side doesn't matter. Good okay. question. That's, that's good to know. Yeah. Um, okay. Is it safe to give your pet expired medications? Do they still work? Um, example? Um, I would say usually no. Um, if it's a prescription medication that uh, keeps your pet's health going and it's all you have until the next day with your vet, it probably won't hurt them, but it probably, you know, it, it could have decreased effectiveness. So if it's a last resort, potentially it's okay, but better to call your vet and get a new prescription or, or go to the urgent care ER to get a new prescription. Okay, great. Um, we had a question about a reverse cough. Reverse sneezing, maybe? And they said cough, but maybe sneeze, they mean, yeah. Okay. If we're asking about reverse sneezing, that can be, um, it can be very dramatic and it can be scary to see because it seems like pets can't get out of that cycle. For some pets, it's a result of allergies. So if your pet has reverse sneezing very frequently, uh, definitely ask your vet about um, an over-the-counter antihistamine or something like that. Reverse sneezing in and of itself is not dangerous though. And if you have any question about whether or not that's what's happening in your pet, there's a ton of really good videos on the internet if you just Google reverse sneezing um, and you can see what it looks like if there's any question. I, I know probably it, it sounds very scary. I think it's it really does. And it can than, seem like yeah. they can't catch their breath. Um, mm -hmm. But reverse sneezing in and of itself isn't dangerous, um, just very dramatic. Um, we have many people saying this is a fantastic presentation. Oh, thank and, you. And, yeah, which it really was. Um, we have a question about seizures. A um, 15 year old Pomeranian that does not bring them to the vet every time he has a seizure, seizure should I be? And we had another question earlier saying, like, how long afterwards sure. or should you always bring, always bring So them? it really depends on um, a few things. Like if your pet has a known seizure history and you work with a veterinarian at controlling them, they should be giving you pretty clear guidelines about when to come to the vet. So like, I know our neurology team here, you know, if your pet has one seizure that only lasts a few minutes and they're normal after it, and they go back to being them normal selves and living their normal lives, you don't necessarily have to bring them in. You probably should at least tell your vet so that they're aware of it. Um, but if your pet has more than one seizure in 24 hours, uh, if they don't return to normal in between the seizures, those are big indications to bring them in. If your pet has never had a seizure and they you know, have a seizure, it's, it's probably a good idea to bring them in just so you can establish a baseline for what's going on. And I will say that, you know, um, seizures, you know, there are true seizures that come from the brain, but there are a lot of other conditions um, like cardiac conditions, uh, having low oxygen levels to your brain that can also cause a pet to have seizures um, or even faint and people can think it's a seizure. So if it's the first time that your pet is having an episode, it's really, really helpful if you, if you can remember to try to videotape it. Um, sometimes it can be hard to remember in the moment, but if you videotape it, then you can show your vet what it looked like. And sometimes we can get a better idea about what's going on if we can actually see the event in action. Okay, great. Um, we have a question about CPR, um, that proper CPR in humans can damage the sternum and ribs. Um, is this the same for pets? It is the same. Um, that's definitely a risk of CPR. Um, I think most of us, you know, just understand that it can happen, but our goal is to, to get a pet back. Um, I will say that doing CPR at home is not for every pet owner. Um, and I think that that's very reasonable if it's not something that you would ever be interested in doing because it can absolutely cause trauma, uh, especially in a, in a cat or a smaller dog um, where you're much bigger than them. So it, it can cause trauma, absolutely. But if you get your pet back, um, the first thing you want to do is get right to the vet where we can assess for that damage. We can, you know, if if um, they can make it out of the hospital, we can manage their pain, any trauma, things like that. Okay, great. Um, okay, how can you tell if your cat is struggling to urinate? That's a very good question. Um, so signs that can uh, indicate to you that your cat is struggling to urinate are very, very frequent trips into the litter box. 
um, licking, especially if it's a, a male cat licking the penis, yowling, vomiting, um, seeming very agitated. If you go to the box to scoop it and they've been in and out a lot and you see no urine, that's a big problem. If you see very small amounts with blood in it, that's also a big problem. Um, so all of those things can tell you that your cat is having trouble urinating. And, and uh, a cat, a male cat with the inability to urinate, it can happen in, in any, you know, cat, dog, female, male, just, I mentioned the male cat because it's most common. If your pet truly can't urinate, that can be a life-threatening emergency and it can happen pretty quickly. So if you have any doubt, best to bring your pet to the ER. Okay, great. Um, we do have one uh, reminder for everyone. There is uh, Diane, I believe, is talking about how her cat unfortunately ate lilies, um, yep. which is a, a good reminder this this time of year that they're very very poisonous. Yes, so. and if I if I could make one PSA, you know, lilies, please tell your friends if you're. <laughs> If you're in the supermarket, I'm one of those nosy people that if I see someone buying lilies, I say, are you getting that for someone with cats? Because it's a really, really um, traumatizing experience. You know, someone gets a bouquet um, to celebrate something and they have no idea that lilies can be so fatal in cats. And then a few days later, their cat ends up being extremely sick. So lilies can cause acute kidney failure in cats and it can happen very quickly. Um, and it's very, very traumatizing and, and really upsetting. So please spread the word. We're coming up towards the holidays yes. where people have lilies. Please spread the word to everyone that lilies kill cats. No, oh, thank you. Yes, we'll, we'll have it. We always put it on our social media. Yeah. We'll do that again, but I think you're right. It's like, even though to us, we know it, right. many people don't. So, um, Okay, does the cat litter, the pretty litter, really work to show if the cat has disease? And if you know about that. Um, I'm not really super I... familiar with pretty litter. That's probably yeah. something that like the uh, primary care doctors are potentially more familiar with. Um, I don't think using pretty litter can hurt, but I wouldn't mm -hmm. rely on it as the sole method of telling if there's something wrong with your pet. That's great, okay. Um, okay, if your dog takes gabapentin, do they become immune to it? Does it, I guess, build up a tolerance? Um... I don't think so. I mean, I do think that sometimes when a dog starts on gabapentin, they can be a little bit sedate from it or kind of wobbly, and they do get used to it in that regard. But I don't think okay. from a pain perspective that they get used to it. Okay. Um, and I do just want to say thank you to uh, Pause New York. There are a lot of volunteers. They do great work. So we they are help and walk um, other people's dogs who can't care for them at the time. So we, we do have a question about first aid items or, or, or maybe if it's not your pet um, and, and you're coming in, is there anything we should know if you're walking someone else's dog? Um, you actually would be surprised about how many dog walkers bring bring animals to the mm -hmm. ER for us because uh, they spend a lot of time with these pets, um, especially if they're a regular dog walker. But just the same things that you would look for in your pet. If, if a dog who normally is very excited to walk is very sluggish, um, limping, having diarrhea, vomiting, uh, doesn't really seem to want to interact with you, seems painful, anything like that, you know, I would definitely recommend trying to to either bring them in or have their owner bring them in. Okay, no, great. Um, we have a question about idiopathic head tremors. Um, her dog has started getting them this year. Uh, what to do, I guess, during them, should she bring her to the ER? I think if it's something that's under management by a neurologist, I would go by whatever guidelines they give. Um, if okay. your pet has head tremors, it is a good idea to, to probably see a neurologist if you're able to, um, to kind of establish a relationship with them, figure out if there are any medications indicated. Um, if it's a self-limiting event, the head tremors and your pet is normal pretty quickly afterwards, I don't think you have to rush them to the vet. But again, you should really have a doctor who manages this long term, who gives you very, very um, concise and complete guidelines about when you should be going to the ER. Great. Um, okay, we have a question about um, paraphimosis. Mm -hmm. I guess, I guess, uh, why does this happen? And would I still need to take the dog to the vet? I guess, the yeah, penis so, did go back in. <laughs> yeah. So. Okay. So if so for those who don't know, that's a condition mm. where the penis gets stuck outside the prep use. Um, and yes, it is an emergency if you can't get it to go back in by yourself. Most common in um uh, uh 
intact male dogs, um, if they have humping behavior, <clears throat> excuse me, or things like that. If you have uh, a dog who is predisposed to this, you definitely should keep sterile lube at home um, because if you can lubricate it and pull the prep use back over it, that's not, you know, that's okay to wait. Um, sometimes it can be caused by like hair rings at the base of the penis. So if it doesn't go back right, go right back in, or if it keeps popping out, definitely should be evaluated by a veterinarian because if it's stuck out for long, it can actually, um, you know, the, can cause some pretty significant damage. Okay. Um, we have a question about different types of thermometers, um, oral versus rectal versus, I know we had a question earlier about um, the infrared, the no touch. Mm -hmm. I don't think the infrared works because pets have fur. Um, as far as I know, we at least don't use them. So I don't think they're very accurate. Um, there are, um, when we say oral, we mean ear, a oral. Um, there are uh, certain oral thermometers made for pets. Um, so if you wanted to purchase one, um, you know, we do use them here if we feel like a pet probably has a normal temperature or if they're very, very agitated and, you know, start alligator rolling when we try to do a rectal temperature, we do use them. Um, it's just with the with the rectal temperature and a digital thermometer, you pretty much know that you're getting an accurate result each time, you know, cause it's a very straightforward thing. With the, the ear thermometer, there's a lot of variability in how, how accurate they are. So potentially, you know, it can be a little bit more variable. But again, you can take an axillary temp with a digital thermometer um, where you put the thermometer up into their armpit. Okay, great, um, let's see. And we had a question about, let's say, hmm, limping. Yeah, what, what's your advice if you notice limping? So it depends on how um, severe it is. If your pet had an obvious trauma, like they got their foot stuck in the park bench um, or something like that, where they could have broken a bone, if they can't bear any weight on the leg whatsoever, that means that they're on a lot of discomfort. Anything like that, dragging a limb, they should come in. If it's a very, very mild limp, you know, they're just a little bit ginger on the foot. It's okay to try to rest them for 24 to 48 hours, as long as they're otherwise acting normally, energetic, eating. Um, you know, and when I say rest, I mean rest, really resting, no jumping up and down off the furniture, don't go out for runs, don't go to the dog park. Um, and then, but if it doesn't go away, you really should see a regular vet. But if there's any chance for a fracture, if they won't bear weight on the foot, if the foot's dragging, seems like they can't move it, that's an emergency. Okay, great. Um, couple more. Should I bring my cat to the vet Is he, if he's having a random aggressive reaction? That's a tough one. Um, <laughs> I would say that, you know, seizures in cats can look like a million different things. So, you know, it is possible if they're aggressive and they don't know who you are, that they could be having some sort of neurologic episode. Um, but aggressive behavior can also be caused by a million other things. It could be caused by discomfort somewhere. It could be caused by, um, you know, my bladder is inflamed. It could be caused by a behavior change. It could be caused by a cat that's outside the window that we don't know about. So aggressive behavior in cats is a little bit tougher. Um, if they're otherwise acting pretty normal, probably best to go to your uh, primary care veterinarian because they know your cat's normal behavior. Um, and then it always starts with a medical workup to make sure there's no medical reason that your cat is acting out. And then if not, then we can move to other things, whether it be um, behavioral work or, or uh, drug therapy for anxiety or things like that. Okay, great. A um, couple more um, a question about essential oils. Are they dangerous for pets? They can be for sure. Um, whether it's in a diffuser or, uh, um, you know, some people put essential oils on their pets, I say in general, stay away from them um, because some of them are very, very toxic to pets. Um, and I would say that if you ever have a question about uh, toxins, the ASPCA website is really, really wonderful. Um, and I would direct you there to figure out, to try to figure out whether or not you know, what you have in your home is toxic to your pet. But as a general rule, like in, in our house, there's no essential oils, there's no diffusers, um, because I don't want to risk it. And I don't know how well some of these things are regulated. So who knows what you're really even getting. Okay. Um, uh, vomiting and diarrhea, I know, obviously, you see many, many pets for that. So when should you come in at that time, you know, if they're sure. 
So if your pet vomits a single time, but they otherwise seem completely normal, I don't think you have to rush right to the vet. I think it's okay, you know, to hold them off food for the day and then try to feed them a bland diet like chicken and rice or something like that at night. And if they never vomit again, you're probably good to go. Same thing with diarrhea. If it's, if it's one episode, um, don't necessarily have to go to the vet. If they have more than one episode in 24 hours of vomiting, if they have profuse diarrhea, especially if it contains blood, if they also don't want to eat, if they're lethargic, if they seem uncomfortable, anything like that, best to have them evaluated. Okay, great. Um, okay. And with that, thank you so much, Dr. Zolo. I know it's been a very, very long day for you. Um, yeah. We're so grateful to you that you're willing to stay late to give this fantastic presentation. Um, thank you also, Kimberly, our education coordinator for helping to coordinate tonight's event and all of our events. Um, and a very, very special thanks to all of you for your continued interest of, in our programming. Um, we invite you to please fill out a short survey that will pop up when you leave tonight's event. Um, we'd love your feedback as well as suggestions for other topics you'd like us to cover, to feature. So um, with that, thanks again, Dr. Zolo, and good night, everyone. Thank you, everyone.